Well, it's cold. Yeah, it is. It's just actually snowy, cold, smoggy, foggy. Yeah, so late. So I think we should blow this popsicle stand <laughs> and go to California for Christmas. Let's do that. Actually, we've been planning to do yes, that for we've months. Been planning we, it for months. We thought, let's go to Disneyland yes. for Christmas. Yes. And in route, we can stop in and see our good friend Dan. Hi. So if you saw the live broadcast a while back, that was Dan moving his locomotive yes. out to the railroad museum in Boulder for the Santa Claus train. So we're going to now go revisit that. I want to show you the actual move of the locomotive. Right. Because that turned out really neat. And uh, I promised you guys we'd get footage of that up other than the live broadcast. <laughs> that was fun, but oh boy. It was really fun. Uh -huh. But anyway, here's the, so here's the move and the Santa Claus train and screwing around with the locomotive and and visiting one of the great great heroes of screwing around, Dan Markov. Yes. How many other people have their own 1877 vintage locomotive flat car and passenger car? Just Dan. Just Dan. So check this out. Dan Markov moving the Eureka and Palisade number four to Boulder. Okay, that is one hell of a locomotive. My finger's in front of the lens. There we go. <laughs> well, hopefully you saw the live broadcast a couple of weeks ago as we started moving Dan's engine. I want to show you Dan's version yeah. of Garage Mahal. It has tracks. <laughs> this is officially uh, listed in the uh, building <laughs> records as an RV shed because they wouldn't give him a building permit for a locomotive repair shop. <laughs> There's not many of those in Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an RV shed, even though it looks a tremendous amount like a locomotive shop. It was uh, here that he hauled this burned out hulk of a locomotive, uh, gee, some 30 years ago and totally restored it right here on these tracks. Here's the original flu sheet out of the engine. He saved that for posterity. So I've been telling you about this engine forever and showing you pictures, but yeah, here it is. There it is in the live. <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite something to see, isn't it? It's neat. I just can't believe how it turned out after Dan got it done. It's absolutely stunning. It's beautiful. Dan's been at this for so long, he's actually got a whole system worked out. He bought two trailers uh, to move this stuff around on, and he's rigged uh, the one here for the tender with this folding ramp. Check that out. That's awesome. Isn't that cool? Used to be we'd have to lay track out into the street and up on cribbing, and it took all day, and now you just unfold the ramp. This is our friend Adam Penalis uh, doing his Hercules the Strongman impersonation. Oh, Adam, Adam, Adam. Actually, this is fairly easy to do. I've done it myself. Uh, locomotive equipment is designed to roll quite easily on the metal tracks. And so you can actually grab a hold of this tender and give a mighty tug. And the next thing you know, you're pulling a train by the Armstrong method. Now, getting this thing up the ramp uh, requires, of course, using a winch. <laughs> so it's sort of like, uh, you know, loading a truck or a car onto a trailer like we did with David's. Uh, yes. Yeah, that was really a neat day. But uh, yeah, you just in this case, uh, something that heavy isn't going to just glide up this ramp without a good deal of pulling. But check it out, everything's all loaded, and we're ready to start our trip to Boulder. This should be fun. Fun, huh? It is fun. What do you think, Adam? <laughs> you He's working on vacation. Now, you don't have one of these just yet. Not yet, I'm working on it. <laughs> Now, if you want to talk about distracted driving, you should have seen the looks on people's faces as we came down the road with this rig. Locomotive on the back of a trailer. Not, not, not the sort of thing you normally see in your no. rear view mirror as a locomotive bearing down on you. No, and then people were honking. That was so funny. Uh, one guy got pissed. I was like, Get that piece of crap out of my... Oh, people. Yeah. But it, uh, it only takes about a half hour to drive out to Boulder, not that far away. A little longer when we take this thing to Colorado, but it's the same idea. 
So it was actually just after lunchtime that we finally arrived in Boulder. Right. And uh, so we stopped and had lunch and waited for the train to catch up to us. And then we started the rather tedious process of unloading the locomotive, which is a bit trickier than oh, loading scary. the locomotive. Because in this particular case, you have to lay some track. Yes. And that turned out to be a lot of work. Yes. They have about a half a mile of narrow gauge track here that was laid by Dan and his friends. Most everything here at the museum is standard gauge. Yes. And in fact, modern equipment. They do have two old steam locomotives that are not operational. This one used to belong to a guy I knew, Rod Edwards. He didn't haul them around. He kept this one on the Heber Creeper. Oh. And then this one, I don't know where exactly they found this one, but uh, they've got it in the collection, also static. It, it doesn't run. A lot of the equipment that they have here is old uh, ex-Union Pacific equipment, which is pretty darn neat. I love UP stuff. So anyway, at this time of year, they do the Santa train for their Christmas festivities and oh, or fundraiser. Fun. <laughs> is this fun? So they put Christmas lights on the train and they run on their scenic railroad, which runs down to Railroad Pass. Not a lot of trees on this train. <laughs> but this is the Santa train because Santa Claus is on board. What's up? <laughs> Well, it's time to unload the locomotive, so let's get started. So the tender comes off uh, more even easily than it went on, because <laughs> if you don't watch out, it'll just roll right off of there once the ramp is down. But getting the locomotive off, well, now that... That's a, a worry. That's a worry and a lot of work. You actually have to lay about 60 feet of track to hook the trailer into the narrow gauge tracks here. And they've got some rails that they've measured out and pre-cut and everything because they do this quite often. And you lay down a few ties and you lay four rails, uh, two on each side for 60 feet of track. And then you pull the locomotive off, and you hope the whole thing doesn't tip over. I thought it was going to a couple of times. Oh, man. Scary. It's scary. It's just unnerving. Dan, of course, has done this a million times, so he's just, yeah, yeah he's whatever. He's cool as a cucumber, but I was having kittens. Oh, my heck. Here's Adam doing the Hercules the Strongman impersonation again. He just picks up a railroad tie and throws it around like a toothpick. <laughs> ah, to be young again. Karen was in charge of rounding up proper spikes for the project and getting those laid out. Holy crap. Almost had to have a new hair do that when parted. <sighs> Come on, people. Be careful for crying out loud. So uh, Dan drove the spikes in with this little sledgehammer. They had a track mall here, but nobody knew how to use it. So they just used that little sledgehammer. It's a lot easier for us old guys. You know, it took us over two hours to lay 60 feet of track. Hey, we're professionals. But I, I think about the Chinese who would lay one mile of track an hour. Yeah. I can't even walk one can't mile know. an hour. And those guys could lay track at one mile per hour. Oh, God bless the Chinese for building our first transcontinental railroad. That's so amazing. They, they did have the advantage that there were 20,000 of them. And yes, and only about 10 of us. About 10 of us. I don't know. Maybe it works out to about the same mileage. I'm not sure. And now comes the scary part. Oh, man. I was looking at the size of the gaps here and everything. Dan, he said, nah, it's no big deal. Gaps on a real frog are wider than this. But I was just going, oh, man, I'd like to see those joints a lot tighter than that. But... The locomotive just rolled right off the trailer and right across the temporary track and onto the permanent track and Dan, as you can see here, isn't the slightest bit nervous about the whole thing. We were the ones Oh, I couldn't breathe. I was like hyperventilating. Oh, good <laughs> crap. I just thought the whole thing was going to tip over or something, but not just rolled right off and then all we had to do was hook up the tender. Well, it had been a long day. No, no kidding. The sun was setting by the time we got things in place, but 
We thought we'd go over to the engine shop and check out Dan's passenger car. Well, here it is. It's progressed since the last time we saw it. Oh, it has. Good grief. It looks like it's almost finished. It looks like it. A lot of little tiny things yet to do. He's been working on all this pinstriping for months. This is actually how the original car was painted. And check this out. They're putting the roofing material on it. Oh, what a job. It had a, a tin lead roof on it with soldered joints on the original car. And Dan is attempting to recreate that using sheet metal because he can't buy the lead alloy anymore. But they're putting this metal roof on here and it looks just exactly like the original roof with soldered joints. Needless to say, none of these guys knew how to do this and so they're learning as they go along, but it's coming right together. Dan has named the car Elsa after his mother. That's his mother's name, Elsa. Dan has built this whole thing entirely from scratch. The only thing here not built by Dan are the wheels. Wow. Springs, everything else are stuff that he's built. Even the doors. Even the doors, the hardwood, the brass light fixtures, everything. Now this is the original car and it's stored there in the open at the museum. Wow. Now, Dan had wanted to restore this car, but it just didn't happen. He decided that it would be easier to start all over, so that's what he did. Here's Eureka and Palisade number seven, another yes. surviving Eureka and Palisade engine. Boy, I hope this gets fixed up someday, just like Dan's engine. Well, come the next morning, Dan was ready to start giving rides. Here come the kids. Here come the kids, and he fired up the locomotive and brought it up to pressure. It's just so neat to see this thing once it actually is under steam. When Dan finished this engine back in 1991, he immediately went to work on a flat car. Oh, of course. Of course, 1870s vintage flat car, because he wanted to have a place to keep his camping equipment. <laughs> and we'd take that out into the wilderness, and we used that uh, flat car back there to, as a patio, really, and we had the barbecue oh, cool. set up on there. And here in the near future, this thing will be pulling the passenger car. Isn't that cool? Wow. Let's see uh, how we're doing in there. Let's get a little more in there. Whoop. Much more. You know, I'm going to have to make a rack here for us guys 60 and older. It goes here and we don't have to bend down for the wood. There you go. Get one of those grabby things. Yeah. Only big enough to hold wood. Now, while the uh, fire is certainly the heart of the boiler, what really makes it work is water. Uh, you need to have water in the locomotive to make all of this stuff work. And in fact, if you run out of water, the locomotive might just blow up. So, well, it's really important to put water in there. And it's done with these things here. These are lifting injectors. There's two of them. This one's on the engineer's side, and this one over here is on the fireman's side. They somehow magically get the pressure of the water to a pressure above the boiler and force it in there. This allows you to force a draft through the boiler when it's cold. There are lubrication injectors and pressure gauges, so you know how much pressure is in your brakes and in your boiler. Notice that nothing is really labeled. You're supposed to know how this stuff works before you try driving the locomotive around. Now these valves are called the tricock, and it's a backup system for figuring out the water level. And here are some of the most important controls in the locomotive, the brakes. This is the brake lever that operates the Westinghouse train brakes. The locomotive wasn't equipped with this when it was built. It was added a few years later. And this controls the air brakes on the locomotive. Now all of these brakes were mechanical when the thing was built. 
Now this is the reversing lever, also known as a Johnson bar. It controls the direction of the locomotive. You shove it all the way forward to go forward and you pull it all the way back to go backwards. But it also adjusts the valve timing to save steam pressure. So if you're just coasting, you can move it slightly toward the middle to save steam. And this is, of course, the throttle. You pull back on this lever to go faster. And it moves this heavy rod right through the middle of the back head here into a valve in the steam dome, feeding steam off to the wheel cylinders to make you go. And it actually doesn't move all that easily. Here we see the view out of the locomotive from the engineer's seat. Gee, you can't see anything, can you? So. The uh, locomotive engineer is usually driving blind, so you'll see them quite often stick their head out the window because from this position, as you can see, you can actually see a little bit of where you're going. I wonder who taught Dan how to run the locomotive. Well, you know what's interesting? After he bought this engine, Chris DeWitt at the Nevada State Railroad Museum in Carson City oh. looked him up and said, do you need any help rebuilding that? Because that's what I do for a living. <laughs> oh my heck. So uh, Chris and Dan worked together on this engine for years. And then Dan could go up to Carson and run the locomotives up there. I see. And learn how to be a locomotive engineer Perfect. since he now owned a steam locomotive. <laughs> driver's Ed. <laughs> <laughs> a little driver's Ed for 19th century steam locomotives. Anyway, it certainly comes second nature to Dan to drive this thing. He looks more at home doing this than he does driving his truck. Well, it looks better, too. Well, it's, an, it's neater than his that truck, his quite track. frankly, so <laughs> I get it. I totally, totally get it. Every time I see this thing, I have to remember what it looked like when Dan got it. There wasn't much left of it. I can only imagine. It had been in a building fire, and then the building had <laughs> collapsed on top of it. Oh, gee. And he had to rebuild all of that, and it's now perfect. Wow. Check it out. What an amazing toy to have. <laughs> no kidding. Dan has certainly perfected the high, <laughs> high art of screwing around. Well, it's time for us to say goodbye to Dan and the Eureka and mosey on to Southern California. Yes, there's a lot of road to burn up between there and there. <laughs> Disneyland awaits. That's right. As does Christmas. Ugh. And I have something up my sleeve. I've arranged something special for Disneyland. Oh, really? We're getting into Walt Disney's private apartment. Ooh. Well, there you go. Dan's locomotive. Yeah. That is, he has got to be the absolute king of screwing around well, I guess to so. restore his own 1877 vintage wood-burning locomotive. Isn't that like the oldest one in America? Yeah, I, I think. It's either that or the Glenbrook, and I'm not sure they're, which is yeah, really, close. really close. And of course, that means that Dan has worked on both of them. Right. Because uh, his friend Chris DeWitt runs the other one, and this mm. one's Dan's, but then they... They get the two engines together and so on and so forth. Mm. But those are the two oldest locomotives, uh, operating locomotives yeah. in America. And uh, Dan's is a toy. Yeah, of course. It's not a museum piece. It doesn't, you know, it's a it, toy. It it's his, he goes, he takes that out on trailers and he screws around with it. And he's getting so good at moving it around. Yes. And now that his boiler certifications are done, mm -hmm. he can take it to Colorado again, which he hasn't been doing for a few years. And we are already making plans. And, yes. Uh, he said he's, you know, he's, he's, he's kind of loose like we are. He makes things up as he goes along. But here pretty soon he wants to start locking down plans to go to Chama. And maybe, just maybe, the passenger car will be ready for Chama. Could be. And that would be really neat. <laughs> so we'll look forward to that. Well, if you haven't been over to the channel, do pop over to the channel. And if you're not a subscriber, you want to subscribe. Absolutely. Because then you get notified, depending, you know, you click the little bell for the notifications mm -hmm. next to the subscribe once you subscribe. Right. And then you can be notified by text or email or however you want to be notified whenever we upload a movie. Right. 
Uh, it's all there spelled out in the thing. And then that way, when we go to Colorado, you will be notified. Right. And you can watch that. Otherwise, you might miss it, and that would just be tragic. That's right. It would just be tragic. So <laughs> the way to achieve both of these things is to click on the blue button. Zoink, you see the blue button that appeared right there? If you're not seeing it, it isn't supported by all devices. Yeah. And that's sort of sad. But, it is. It's uh, it terrible. is what it is. Well, we're not sure how you found this movie on the internet. We hope you didn't find it boring. And we will see you here again on Tuesday with The Collector's Attic. We'll see you then. <laughs> Bye. Bye. I think we lost the light. I think we did too. <laughs>